We're ready to go. Alrighty. Okay, so welcome everyone who's joining. We'll give folks a few more minutes to join. Um, it's still pretty early. Uh, and we're seeing lots of folks coming in, so that's great. Um, hi, Phil. Uh, today, as many of you know, is our last session. There we go. We're up on YouTube now. Um, this is going to be our last session for the Observer's Handbook. Uh, and we've had such a nice time bringing it to you. Um, I will mention we have most of what we usually get here. So welcome, everybody. Feel free to say hi in the, in the chat. And for those who are participating in the chat, don't forget to turn, turn your all panelists bar to all panelists and attendees if you want to talk to everybody and not just Alistair and I. Um, so hello, everybody. Feel free to shout out where you're from, too. Uh, so today we have a slight change. James has been called away on an emergency. And so you are stuck with just Alistair and I. But we're pretty great, so don't worry. Sorry, Alistair is pretty great. I don't know about me. <laughs> oh, you are. So we're going to talk about the st stars in the deep sky. Um, just a heads up that uh, our solution will probably be if we can't answer your questions about the Observer's Handbook, because this is our wrap-up session where we're going to answer those questions. If we can't answer them, we will save them, and we will ask James at a different time. Uh, to answer some of the questions that you may have. If you have extra questions after the fact, feel free to email me. My email is, I'll just type it out, jenna.hines at rask.ca. So there it is in the chat if you need it. I am proud to say that it only took me the entirety of this series to actually get my physical Observer's Handbook 2020 copy. Only seven sessions out of the eight. <laughs> um, and so with no further ado, given that it is 3.32 or whatever it may be where you are, uh, we are going to get started. Today we have Alistair. Alistair wrote bits and pieces of the stars and deep sky section and does a ton of stuff out in, oh no, it's Edmonton, right? Edmonton. Edmonton, yep. good, okay. And um, including taking, I believe you take, well, you're here on an earlier session, but you also take a bunch of beautiful astro photos. I remember you taking some really nice ones of the lunar Thank you. 2019. Um, and so we're going to jump into the stars today. Okay, thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, when I was, uh, you'll be wondering maybe about the cartoon uh, there in front of you. Uh, when I was uh, first asked to host the, this segment, my first thought was, it's like, what? The stars and deep sky, that's everything outside the solar system. And <laughs> like, that's kind of daunting. Um, and so it, it reminded me immediately of this uh, cartoon uh, that was out in the uh, 70s. Uh, so. It's just a little uh, bit here and there, right? It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with with that, we'll uh, jump uh, right into uh, the uh, handbook itself. All and right. uh, if, Jenna, if you could please put on page 270. There we go, the stars. Yeah. Um, so the handbook, I'll uh, introduce a little bit. Uh, it, it, it's like an Aztec temple. It's full of fantastic and interesting things, but to the beginner, it's a bit daunting because they tend to see the 300 stairs in front of them to climb to get into the temple. And so they might get give up. Um, and so I'm here to show you that um, there are elevators in there and you're allowed to skip past the things uh, to get to what interests you the most. So you know, here we are, the beginner wants to know something about stars. Uh, open the handbook and the very first thing they see is a page full of foreign words <laughs> and Latin pronunciations and conjugations and go, well, uh, this is not the thing for me, obviously. Uh, but it's, um, so skip that off the start. Uh, there is no requirement for you to read every single page of the handbook. Um, but in a year or two of observing, you'll find that you'll come back to these pages and find out how do they pronounce camelopardalis? And, and there's a pronunciation guide on there. So um, we won't have you speaking Latin in, in two or three years, but uh, it's actually good to know that at some point, hey, there is a place you can go and check on um, these uh, kinds of things. Um, so the handbook and modern scientific astronomy has its roots in the Western Renaissance enlightenment and Latin and Greek were the languages that you use to show off your rank and importance. <laughs> uh, but in an interesting twist of history, the only sources of those original texts came through the dedicated Arabic scholars who made translations before the fall of Rome and the loss of the Library of Alexandria and all that. So uh, it turns out then that constellations 
uh, that we see in the sky are the Latin names and the bright stars follow the Greek alphabet. And somewhere else in the handbook, there is a list, uh, a page uh, down at the bottom of the page somewhere where it tells you what the uh, Greek alphabet is. And a, it shouldn't surprise you that a lot of the, the ones um, in there are actually semi-familiar, you know, alpha. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, everybody knows alpha. Well, hey, it's, it's the first letter. Um, so, um, you know, don't, don't be scared by the fact, oh, it's all Greek to me. It's, it's not all Greek. Um, but star names uh, are, are best understood via the children's game of telephone, where the message goes around a circle and comes back, sometimes whole, sometimes quite corrupted. So names would often be things, star names back in, in the 2000 years ago would often be names like uh, the left shoulder of the warrior, which is usually a reference to a position in instead of an actual name. And so that would get translated into Arabic and then mistranslated or transliterated uh, back into Latin as just a bunch of syllables that don't really have any meaning. And so sometimes uh, a star name, it's just a name. It doesn't really come from anywhere or mean anything. Um, but uh, since the 80s, all of us have become increasingly exposed to the uh, wonderfully rich heritages of uh, many cultures around the world, and they all have their own names and meanings for constellations and stars, all equally as valid as the Latin ones. It's just, well, the current scientific uh, part where we've, we've got to in our modern age happens to have come from Greek and Latin, but everything else is, is just as valid and every bit as interesting. The, the favorite um, uh, of many people is, for example, Subaru, and it's like, oh, it's not a car, it's mm -hmm. actually the Pleiades star cluster. And so, yes, uh, you know, different cultures have th their whole stories, sky stories, uh, around uh, different uh, things than the um, the the familiar Perseus the warrior and uh, um, and uh, Andromeda and Medusa and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, an aside here as well, in this modern age of uh, search engines, it might be faster to check the internet, but many pa web pages don't get updated. Uh, or you get dragged onto the flat earth or you see a mm. picture of the upcoming blue blood howling jumbo squirrel moon and <laughs> you sort of get distracted as to what you're looking for. But you can rest assured that all the information in the handbook has been vetted by world renowned experts in the field. And if there's something in particular you're not looking for, there's a link to it typically at the bottom of one of the pages for more detailed information. So it is literally the go-to reference. So um, next page, uh, Jenna, we go to the feature star field. Okay. And um, every year it's something slightly different. And I found that even observers of 20 or even 30 years experience, you sort of read this and go, oh, I didn't know that, or, oh, there's something neat over on this corner that I just wasn't familiar with. So um, it, it's a wonderful place to uh, uh, reconnect with uh, a constellation that might be off to the side a little bit. And um, Chris makes sure that many of these objects in here are available uh, to uh, binocular users. So you don't necessarily uh, need a telescope. And they're really nicely presented. I really like the, the sort of realistic way because I think a lot of the times we get distracted by those Hubble images and you go out and you look at it and you're like, that's nothing like the Hubble image. And it's like, well, no, the Hubble image took 24 hours of footage, like of, of photons. Of course, it's nothing like the Hubble image. So it's really nice to, oh, I didn't realize Randall actually drew them. That's very cool. Randall Rosenfeld, our archivist, drew them. Um, and they look amazing. Mm -hmm. They they certainly do. Ske sketching is something I started out with, and uh, the the joke uh, in in my cohort was that um, I like to look at um, uh, faint galaxies, and I said, well, the reason I do is because they're the easiest things to sketch. It's just a fuzzy little blob that's maybe a bit <laughs> elongated, uh, because I'm I'm a, a lousy artist, and and certainly if you look at the Orion Nebula, that's very daunting to start as your first sketch. So start with star clusters. It's can you draw a point? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you, you you can draw ten points then, and you've got yourself a, a star cluster at the start of it. That's a very good point. Yeah. 
Um, okay, moving on. Uh, finding list of sun named stars. This is uh, actually kind of neat uh, because I've, I've, of course, used the handbook for 30 years, but every now and then I uh, open it up or someone asks me something and I discover something in the handbook that's been there since forever, but I just never um, uh, came across it or had to refer to it. Um, but uh, here we are. Uh, these are the ones that every navigator uh, needed to know back, uh, whether it was a boat or a plane, you needed to know these uh, stars. And um, I came across this because I was helping someone a brand, brand new to astronomy with their three star alignment. And it's like, which one's Vega? Which one's Arcturus? Go, oh, okay, we have to start out. And, and some people just don't know these things. And so um, the stars that are in that list for your three star alignment are going to be one of the ones on uh, this page. Um, but don't worry, you don't need to memorize all of them. Uh, I decided to test myself and I recognized 51 of the 85 that are listed here. So there's a few um, yeah, uh, like yeah, uh, on the right middle of Mapaluk, uh, Cassidus, like, never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. Don't even know what it is. Um, but Merak. But, no, don't worry, it's like, yeah, Merak, ah, no, no that. Um, and so the other test I gave myself was, without looking at the constellation, just looking at the name, oh. do I know where in the sky this is? Because it's like Murfak, of course I know Murfak. And then, uh, which one again is it? <laughs> um, and so it, it turned out, I actually only know 36 of these. So um, don't worry, um, you know, you'll, you'll come at it uh, uh, slowly you start with Vega Arcturus and, um, and uh, uh, Sirius and, and you'll get the first top 10 and, and that, that'll help you for the first few years. And then after that, it's, it's only really, um, you know, your interest that will take you um, deeper. I have, I have a quick question. What is, when you're saying three star alignment, I have never sailed nor flown. Does that just to figure out is that because i know that you can do that with telescopes is that has something to do with navigation as well uh to, to a certain extent um for uh navigation uh the typically uh what uh, navigators would need would be a handful of stars around the sky that they could then measure the altitude and azimuth and then using their tables they'd be able and and, and the time of day they'd be able to figure out their position on the planet um, based off cool. of two or three of those uh, bright stars. So you need a smattering all around the globe to make sure that at some point there's something in this, the sky for you to, mm -hmm. to latch onto. And so these are the ones, again, that it's like if it was useful for navigators, it's useful for a computer to latch onto three stars to get your uh, coordinate system uh, locked in on. Right. And then the one last question, mostly because I think this is cool and I'd love to learn how to do it. Is that what they'd use sextants for is measuring the sort of the altitude off the horizon? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, if anyone knows how to use a sextant in the comments, please let me know and then teach me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, just quick aside, there was somebody at one point uh, on, on a public star night, I was helping them people with their telescopes and they showed me what are these things? And it was a World War II navigator had top secret on it um, oh. set of uh, planispheres for navigating their planes and just like this is so cool that so cool. it's like and and it 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 used to be top secret information because it, wow. it, it was all about the you know, security uh, of, uh, of of the country oh. so that's uh, cool neat kind of thing there okay um Moving on, the brightest stars. Um, as a rule, uh, we humans love lists. I mean, you won't believe <laughs> number eight. <No. laughs> um, uh, seriously though, uh, knowing a few of these uh, uh, bright stars is uh, great at outreach events for the wow factor, uh, helping the mind reach out to uh, the untouchable. And as you gain experience, more and more of the columns in the following pages will uh, begin to make sense. As a beginner, this is probably not the place to start. Um, and um, you can simply skip ahead to page uh, 285, and there you'll get the top 50. Um, and, um, 
and these are the top 50 by uh, brightness going from brighter to fainter, whereas the previous set of pages was going from zero hours right ascension uh, all the way around the sky in order of position on the sky. Whereas this one is, is going to be more useful for uh, the beginner and for uh, uh, helping out at the telescope. So during the summer, uh, you know, people will ask you about uh, Vega and just like, well, there it is. And uh, the most important column is probably the one right next to the name D for distance in light years, 25 yeah. light years away. So this is where it's uh, very um, uh, uh, helpful. And then inevitably, just like, oh, yeah, and there's Deneb. And someone's like, how far is Deneb? And what I would do um, at our observatory would be, hang on. Flip, you know, here's the source, the handbook. I can't remember all these numbers, and rrunk, there it is. Um, and uh, so uh, Deneb is a few lines down, about a third of the way down, and it's 1,400 light years away. Whereas you know, it's only a little bit fainter than Vega, uh, which is um, only 25 light years away. So you get to talk about the sort of these wow factors of geez, how bright must that star be to be you know, more than 50 times farther away and, all, and just about the same brightness. So it's a really neat uh, page for that. Um, one of the things um, I was um, uh, that, that it, uh, hit me is that, wait a minute, Arcturus is brighter than Vega? I thought it would be neat to go back to the handbook 30 years ago and see if the order was different because I've always remembered it the other way around. So, I mean, they're very, very close in brightness and that's the, uh, the, the fourth column there. Um, so that it's just uh, down in the hundredths of a magnitude difference. So it, it could be possible that I'm remembering it rightly that as uh, um, precision has increased that the, uh, the star order has uh, changed slightly. Hmm. Um, I but, guess that would change uh, if they were variable stars or something like that too, right? Yes. That, that and that, yeah. So Betelgeuse is on there somewhere, and and it right. it does vary. Like it it. Oh, and there's oh, a it says v. v. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point from Lori. Lori Roche just pointed out in the chat as well that it's it's interesting to show people that Polaris is so much dimmer than they thought because a lot of folks think that Polaris is bright when instead it's just perfectly placed. <laughs> It's a song lyric from the 70s, the brightest star that shines, the North Star is like, no, it's not. Oh, that's not true, yeah. <laughs> Spreading lies. Yeah. Um, while we're on the, the subject of the brightest stars and, and naked eye observing, I find it's one of the most uh, enjoyable parts of, of doing a meteor watch. Uh, typically, you're in a group of three to eight people uh, just looking up at the sky, no telescopes. And there's always someone in this small group who can share tidbits of information. And quite often, it's from these very pages that the person has managed to memorize. And, and uh, But it, it's always, um, oh, so what's the, uh, you know, does the handle of the Big Dipper, what, what's its star name? And just uh, yes, Alcade. And, and you wouldn't, it's actually on the list here because it's one of the brighter ones. But um, quite often, um, it's a real mishmash of, uh, of information, but you find out some really neat things while uh, just watching uh, the stars in the sky while you're uh, leaning back. The preceding page uh, to this one has the spectroscopy of stars. Um, and essentially, it's really of interest to the more scientifically inclined. At the observatory in Edmonton, we happen to have an eyepiece with a tiny little grating in it, and that splits up the light into the rainbow uh, of uh, colors. And you can actually, for some stars, see emission lines and absorption lines. So that you can do a little bit of uh, 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 science outreach uh, with that. Uh, but um, it's also, if you go into uh, reading this page in a little more depth, that there's some room for citizen science with DSLR cameras here. Oh. Uh, so, and then resources at the bottom. So again, oh, so it's nice. the, um, you know, the, the, the first thing on your list. It's like, ah, uh, uh, what, what should I look for? Open the handbook and, and, and there it is. Um, skipping forward now to the nearest stars on page 286, um, it, I find reading this really opens the imagination for space travel and the wonder of uh, what's out there. It would be uh, interesting to go back 
50 years to compare the lists and see how the state of our knowledge uh, has evolved since then. And the following three pages, and, and this is really unusual for the handbook, it's three wonderful pages of description and explanation. So uh, it, it's in many ways, it's a mini time capsule of the history of modern astronomy, of how we know what we know in terms of being able to know that Vega's 25 light years away. I mean, we can't measure that easily. And it's like, well, explained in here is, is how we got to uh, be able to do that and, and who the, the key people were. Um, you'll have all heard of Barnard Star and Alpha Centauri, known to be uh, close for over a hundred years. Um, and indeed, they are the first and second uh, objects on the list. Barnard Star uh, features in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of course as well as many other science fiction stories that are uh, semi-realistic. Um, but the first one that uh, was ever actually measured in terms of its distance and a very slight shift in its position against the background star, that's the parallax thing where you stick your finger out in front of you and you close one eye and open the other and go back and forth and your finger sort of shifts against the background. And the amount of shift tells us essentially how far away it is. And the first one to ever be measured was 61 Cygni. And that's 15th down the list. So, you know, bit by bit, we've found more and closer uh, stars. And uh, things like the Gaia um, uh, uh, robotic observatory out there in space is measuring stars once again with uh, really amazing precision. It would and be fascinating that, that to see that change. Change a few yeah. things in that list. Add a new star, like the WSE there in you know, line number three. You can be sure that wasn't there 50 years ago, let alone even uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're learning more and more about uh, the, the area of space uh, right uh, close to us. And that's one of the most important things, I think, when we talk about, especially the observer's handbooks. It's nice that they're, they're labeled every year with the... Uh, with the year that they were made in, but our, our knowledge is constantly changing based on how we figure out how to look at things in a new way. Like it just, I mean, even what, probably 20, 30 years ago, we didn't even know there were exoplanets around other stars. Exactly. Um, and then yeah. I was just flipping through and I noticed that it said, you know, here that there's, you know, um, there, it talks all about the planets. We have eight systems within five parsecs that are reported to have planets. And I'm sure that information wouldn't have been in there even 25 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, the the I, I always love that history of astronomy where uh, at, at some point uh, before it's it's a question: Are there other planets around stars? And and of course, oh yeah, there's thousands of them. <laughs> and I, you know, I love I love that change. You know, it's it, you know similarly to uh, galaxies a hundred years ago. The big question was: Are these blobs of light just nearby gas clouds or are they these you know billions of stars and we didn't know back then of course now it's like oh pff, yeah <laughs> especially um, when you put it that way too I, I find it hilarious you know that sort of like are there other worlds as you were saying and now like 16 year olds are finding exoplanets <laughs> yeah yeah and and, and uh, like one of my friends said uh, it was like pause for a second think about it we're actually driving on mars how cool is that? And you know, like That's you said, to a sixteen-year-old, it's like we've been on Mars since I've been born. Yeah, <laughs> but it's so cool. We we're yeah. driving a robot on them anyway. Well, yes, it's very cool. Time has we've done some cool stuff with the time that we have. Indeed. Um, shifting on back to the, the thing at hand. No, that's okay. Um, we're, we we uh, enter um, double and multiple stars. Oh, oh, sorry. Shift I past there we go. No, yep. that's okay. Um, uh, these started out in the 1600s as a curiosity. You had two stars nearby. Are they related or in the same line of sight? And thanks in part to uh, William Herschel and his and others' observations became the base for the triumph of Newton's universal law of gravitation. That was how we knew that it applied to out there. It wasn't just ho what holds the moon to the earth or the earth to the sun. It's like, no, it also works everywhere. 
Um, so, and in your lifetime, uh, with some of the very close double stars, they move enough that you can actually notice that. So if you keep good records and make neat sketches, you can come back 10, 15 years later and go, oh, yeah, it's moved. Oh, that's so cool. Um, and, and of course, uh, for many of us, uh, double stars are just simply beautiful to look at. Uh, you get uh, very uh, equal pairs like cat size in the distance. Sometimes they're very unequal. Sometimes there's uh, different colors, like the most uh, famous uh, colored double star. Well, maybe not the, but probably is Albireo. Right. And, you know, it's got, you know, beautiful <laughs> topaz and, uh, well, yellow topaz and blue topaz as I like to call them. <laughs> um, and so for the beginner here, um, you don't have to go you know, line by line through here. You can actually skip to page 296 and there's your um, list of essentially the most, yeah, go by, there we go. Um, the, 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 the list of the most colored double stars that are out there all conveniently uh, arranged by uh, season. And so that's something that you might have trouble finding on the internet. It's like, what are, you know, what are the best ones? And, and the neat thing down here the, on the right column there, you've got exclamation marks. And it's yeah. just, if, it, if it's got three exclamation marks, go for that first. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's going to be your, your best. Does uh, BEAU uh, stand for beautiful? Yep. That is an excellent column title name. <laughs> How beautiful is it? And it's like, whoa. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, you know, you can, because uh, sometimes uh, double stars are just white and white. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's really nice to see color. But uh, speaking of color, favorites of mine are the page before, um, and they're called carbon stars, and they're great for uh, city sidewalk um, astronomy when we will be able to do that again. Uh, but carbon stars, uh, they're not well known by um, the, uh, the, the beginners. Typically in your first four or five years, you, you might not come across these. Um, but I was delighted one year to find this in the handbook. I was like, oh, if only there was a list. Oh, there is a list, of course. <laughs> And because um, because I have a favorite, two of them. Uh, one of them is uh, V Aquilae, and it's on the uh, on the way to M11, the wild duck cluster in Scutum, and T Lyrae, and not far from Vega. And um, essentially, what carbon stars are is literally it's the ash of nuclear combustion. Carbon soot gets ejected into the upper layers of some stars, tinting them from either a sort of a hot orange coal down to the deepest pinprick of blood. Um, uh, Arloporus uh, is known as Heinz Crimson Star. Uh, and so um, the, the thing to be aware of is you need to keep going back to this list because um, essentially all of these stars are variable stars. And when they're at their hottest in their cycle, they typically glow a little more orange. And when they're at their coolest, then that's when they go into the, the deeper uh, red colors. And so sometimes you just have to keep on going back. And just literally uh, two nights ago, I was out and I had a look at uh, T. Lyrae and it's uh, sort of a medium at the moment. So it's a nice orange. And, and um, you know, you think of uh, Albireo there with its yellow topaz and that's just like, that's yellow. Whereas these stars are orange. You know, it's there's you know it's like oh that's color <laughs> um so that's so um, cool that that um sort of leads us on to the the variable star section um because all of those stars were variable stars and um what uh whoop, just a second here i catch my my notes um it, it's Variable stars are where sort of curiosity meets uh, citizen science. Um, the, 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 the variable observers are the quilters of astronomy, uh, fanatics to be sure, but in the best way. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, watching a, 
a star actually change brightness. Uh, it, it's like uh, keeping in, in touch with a distant friend. You get to watch them go through. Uh, they're reliable in terms of they will change, but what they will change to is you're not quite sure. So each of these has a certain different kind of personality as the stars vary in brightness. And the most famous one is the one in the uh, right uh, there, um, Beta Persei, Algol, the demon star. For It was long known, and it was called the demon star because it would vary in brightness. To It was one of the only things in the sky that changed. And so that is Eye of the Medusa uh, in, wow. in the Greek mythology. Oh, and that's where every once in a while you see Perse uh, Perseus depicted holding Medusa's head. So that would be where Medusa's head is in the constellation. Yes. Oh, cool. Yep. Um, and uh, and so that, that's always neat when you can pull the story into it. Um, and and uh, the, the easiest uh, star to start watching is Delta Cephei, which is in the, the lower right there. And, you know, I can guarantee you every night you go out and have a look, it will be slightly different than the night before. Um, it does vary quite um, regularly on, in, in terms of a, a basic pattern. Uh, to the eye, um, you'll be able to, to pick it up um, uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly easily, but you just have to compare it to the other stars that are on there and you'll, you'll notice within a couple of days, oh yeah, yeah, it is different. Uh, so it, it's kind of neat to, to see that. Uh, and then uh, a uh, well-known to Trekkies out there, Omicron Seti, um, for one of their uh, stories they had was a planet, Omicron Seti 3. It would be an awful place to have a planet because the star expands out to the orbit of Mars and then contracts back again. So not a good place for uh, for an actual uh, planet. Terribly uh, unpredictable. Well, but, I mean, maybe uh, predictable, just terribly hot and then cold. <laughs> But there it is, and and uh, variables. Um, it's you're you're opening up just um, a uh, uh, a wonderful treasure trove of different uh, uh, characteristics out there. Uh, Omicron Seti Mira um, is uh, it varies on a I think it's 14 month. Uh, uh, pattern. So just every now and then you're uh, um, especially in and around uh, Perseid meteor watching time, poof, there it is. It's like, holy smokes, that's bright. I, I didn't see it like that last year. Um, and that's sort of how I discovered it. I had known about it, but never seen it before. And then all of a sudden there it was, it's just like, that has to be it. Uh, <laughs> so um, a neat way of doing it. And, and I fell uh, in love with the cataclysmic variables. Those are ones that uh, tootle along at the same brightness, and all of a sudden, it's uh, cataclysmics happen when you've got one star feeding gas onto another, and when um, when there's enough stuff, boom, nuclear explosion, oh. and the gas um, uh, well combusts nuclear wise, uh, and um, the star suddenly jumps in brightness. Uh, SS Cygni, which is um, in there. Um, it, it's it blows up about once a month and um it's really neat it, it sort of sits there at, at 11th magnitude um fairly straightforward for a four inch telescope uh, in the backyard and then all of a sudden poof it's at eighth magnitude oh, um and, cool. and so it's and and no one can actually predict the next time it's going to go off. And so you might actually be, when you're looking at it, the first person to see it actually starting its climb where it's like, that's, it's brighter than usual, but it's not at its maximum. And over the course of three hours, you can watch, um, you know, astrophysics in action as the, the, the uh, material combusts and it becomes brighter. So that, that's, uh, and, and there's many more of these types of uh, uh, stars around the sky, but that's sort of the, the big one. And it's, it's available up in Cygnus. So for many, many months of the year. Uh, so it's, it's a, a really neat thing. Um, the, the, uh, so I, as I said, it's the quilters of astronomy. If you like, uh, if you're an obsessive compulsive person, variable stars will get you uh, watching for, um, for a long, long now, time. Lots of interesting stuff. We have a quick question um, from Katrina back on carbon stars. You mind if I, we go double mm -hmm. back for a second? So the question is, um, can you explain how to find 
um, these in the sky by position. Uh, and she thinks it's RA and deck. I'm um, starting at zero degrees, but it looks confusing. Yes, um, the the uh, thankfully, um, if you've well these days with the modern computer go to stuff, you typically only have to type in the star name, and your 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 scope will slew over there. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, the 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 position on the sky, the um, H and M, the R A, it's similar to longitude on the Earth. And it goes, but instead of zero to 360, it's zero to 24 hours. And then the declination is like your latitude on the earth. So the plus is north latitude, which will be uh, easy to see for us in the Northern hemisphere. Um, but yeah, this is something that um, it, it would be very challenging for um, a raw beginner to just jump in and uh, look for one of these without a little bit of uh, help from uh, a telescope or mm -hmm. uh, decent uh, star charts. But um, Sky Atlas 2000 has T. Leri in it, and uh, so uh, some of the, the brighter ones are uh, do show up in uh, your your pocket guide to uh, the sky. So a few of them you'd be able to star hop to. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we took a look at cataclysmic variables. I'm just going to briefly mention that yep. um, with the robotic telescope that we have, that we're working on getting up to speed to make available to members, um, it's essentially a project that allows you to uh, do astrophotography and science to be part of astrophotography and science teams. And it's a 16 inch telescope. I can send out information about it if you're curious and you haven't heard about it yet. But one of the projects that the science team is getting up and going is looking at cataclysmic variables with the telescope. Anyhow, okay. So. Okay. Um, uh, expired stars. Um, I'll just briefly say here um, that uh, the, the, the lives and especially deaths of stars just fires the imagination. So in this section, uh, editor uh, Emeritus Roy Bishop points out uh, where uh, some of these uh, strange animals uh, uh, sit in the sky. Uh, uh, most of them, uh, you know, companions to black holes. And, you know, one of them is even visible in a 60 millimeter telescope. So the, the um, a lot of uh, this part of astronomy is that using your mind to reach out and sort of uh, with your imagination, you can um, uh, uh, observe these and, uh, and and just sort of enjoy, you know, what we've learned. It's not just a point of light. That thing is actually a white dwarf. Um, but uh, I, I don't have the time to go in to explain all of that. And, and again, uh, to summarize, uh, one of the things with the handbook is that in many ways, it's a history of astronomy and it's astronomy in a nutshell. Uh, but yeah, just try not to uh, um, read it all in one go or, no. <laughs> or, or feel it all. Uh, you know, don't, don't feel pressured to uh, read a whole chunk of it, but just you know, start somewhere that, uh, that catches your imagination and read a bit. So onto the, the deep sky. Um, the the uh, you know Galileo was literally the the first person to see that most of these little fuzzy patches in the sky that were known in antiquity were actually made of stars like the Beehive Star Cluster just its stars and the Milky Way was one of the inscrutables from the dawn of time and all of a sudden with the telescope it's they're all made of stars. And so for a while, almost all of these little clouds, uh, literally Latin is nebula, um, is, uh, means cloud. Um, all of these clouds were thought to be just a whole bunch of stars, but so far away, you couldn't quite split them into stars. But bit by bit, we realized, oh, some of them are made of gas. Um, now, um, the... the uh, the, the first question that a beginner might have. So this is the deep sky. So that must mean there's a shallow sky. <laughs> and um, it's uh, the, the deep sky sort of came about uh, when uh, one of the astronomy writers, Walter Scott Houston, he uh, essentially popularized the term that just meant anything that is outside our solar system that's not a double 
star or a multiple star. And so it sort of caught on. So the shallow sky sort of by backwards uh, coming in is our solar system. So sometimes <laughs> they, they use that for comets are, the sh are in the shallow sky. Um, Chris Vaughn uh, has a great uh, introduction to uh, deep sky observing what uh, the different objects are in one of the uh, uh, Insider's Guide to the Galaxy uh, sections. So uh, definitely uh, please um, have a look at that because uh, he explains a lot about what the um, various uh, object types are. I will grab um, the link to it. We actually I even have two. We have one about galaxies and then one specifically about Messier and MGC objects. So I will send the links out to those. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, deep sky observing, I find, plays to our, our sense of beauty, uh, the uh, indescribability almost, uh, but are wanting to know more what's out there. Um, and, 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 and it makes one calm and, and the wow of seeing, say, 100,000 stars, like uh, some of the globular clusters in a big telescope. It's, I literally cannot count the number of stars in that eyepiece field. There's just so many. Um, you know, it's, it's really uh, something to, uh, to behold. Um, and um, it, it, it it's knowing that sometimes a speck of light is actually a quasar, something that is in the near billion of light years away. And um, uh, yet another one that we managed to, to do with uh, a large uh, a telescope, a 20 inch telescope, is we saw a, a gravitationally lensed quasar um, in Ursa Major. This is where um, Einstein predicted that um, uh, very strong gravity uh, will actually split the images of something more distant into two things. And so we found, uh, we hunted it down and, and saw this in a 20 inch telescope and it was right at the very edge of vision. Um, but, you know, to an average you know, person, it's just like, well, you know, can't even see the thing that you're trying <laughs> to point out in the telescope. But, you know, for us, it was just this, wow. Cause, you know, just like, Einsteinian relativity, you can see it with your eyes. And so that, that was just one of those, uh, the, the cool things I tend to get um, out, of, um, very cool. out of the deep sky. Um, so if you don't know where to start, well, right here is the best place. Uh, we've got experts uh, to help guide you from uh, the easiest uh, through uh, to the very challenging when you're ready. Um, and, and it sort of breaks down um, all of the different types of deep sky objects. Uh, a favorite of mine are the open star clusters. Um, one of the, so uh, open or galactic star clusters are just literally groups of stars, um, anywhere from 10 to several hundred um, stars, all gravitationally bound, uh, typically in the telescope, the most probably famous one are the Pleiades star cluster, uh, where you, uh, especially in binoculars, just one of the most beautiful objects out there in the sky. Um, they're very easy to draw, as I said, because they're only often 10 points of, uh, of light to draw. But the other thing is that they punch through the uh, veil of light pollution that we have in cities. And so, uh, the, say the Andromeda galaxy, which overall is bright, and you can see with the unaided eye from the country, in the city, it can be a tough object. But there are many star clusters that happen to be um, quite bright and have very individual bright stars that punch right through the, the light pollution and are uh, very pretty to look at. Uh, among the, the favorites are the, the double cluster, and those aren't even messy objects. So that, that's another thing where Messier, you tend to think, oh, these are the top 100 objects to look at. In many ways, they are. But um, as it turns out, um, the telescopes that they uh, used uh, back then weren't very good at resolving stars. And um, many of these star clusters are actually quite visible in a small telescope in the backyard. And so uh, you can, uh, so some of the, uh, which we'll get to in a moment, the, the finest NGC's new general catalog will contain, if you see star cluster OC, those are the ones to, uh, to go for first because they will be the, the most obvious. Um, globular star clusters, those are uh, compact 
uh, round ball shaped uh, objects from hundreds of thousands of stars to, to millions. Many of them just look like a, a, a cotton puff uh, in, in a telescope, uh, in, a, in a small telescope. But as you crank up the size of the telescope, you can then start to see more and more of these things. So, um, and there's a limited number of these things out there. there there's um, in our galaxy, although our galaxy has uh, thousands of them, um, the, the brightest ones that we can see here uh, through a backyard telescope, it's only um, a, a bit more than a hundred of them. So it's a nice list to, to check off and, and always uh, start with where the mag is the brightest. So that's the lowest number. Um, so right there uh, at the very top of the list, 47 Tucane. Unfortunately, you can't see that from Canada, um, okay. but it's, for, it's fourth magnitude. Did I mispronounce that? Tucana? Tucane? I'm not sure. Um, but it was it's so bright, they thought it was just a star in the constellation. Um, wow. And uh, uh, so, so uh, th those are the ones uh, um, uh, to go for there. But the other ones that uh, often don't show up on too many lists are the planetary nebula. They're called planets, planetary nebula. They've got nothing to do with planets other than they reminded Herschel of what Uranus looked like in his telescope. So quite often, the most famous one uh, would be, say, the Ring Nebula or the helix, these huge circular holes in the middle that look like an eye. Uh, but many of them are uh, much younger than that. And so the gas has not had time to spread. And so the gas is in a much tighter ball around the central star, um, so much so that it's only a few arc seconds across. And, and so that would be um, like, if, if you imagine uh, Jupiter, looking at Jupiter, where it's got a nice sizable disk, a lot of planetary nebula are um, almost 10 times smaller than that, but it means they're bright. Uh, so even though their total magnitude might be 10th magnitude, it's all crammed into a tiny little disk and you can actually see the disk. And so when I was uh, cutting my teeth, so to speak, in, in downtown Montreal, using the, the telescope there overlooking downtown Montreal, I was able to find a lot of these small planetary nebula. And some of them are soft edge, some of them are hard edge, some of them have stars in the center that you can see, some of them don't. And it's a great way of training your eye to see detail on things like Mars. Um, and planetary nebula, because if they're small but bright, um, then um, they're going to be very easy to uh, see in the city, other than you need to crank the power because they're such a tiny disk, mm -hmm. but I, I found them very rewarding as, as, as an observer. Um, so the, um, I, I'm not quite sure how much to, time to spend on um, the messy objects uh, because Chris did such a, a marvelous thing, but essentially what started out for a comet hunter when he was stumbling on these uh, little uh, clouds uh, in, the, in the sky, things that reminded him of a comet but weren't. He started that list, uh, but then it expanded. And it's not often noted that his final catalog is actually titled uh, Catalog of Star Clusters and Nebula. So he knew many of those objects were star clusters. After all, at the end of his first version of his catalog, he had the Pleiades in there. Mm. And it's like, it's all stars. He didn't actually see any of the nebula in there at all. Right. That um, one I always thought was a little, a little questionable when he was saying it was comet like. I was like, I mean, it's, it's pretty obviously stars. <laughs> yeah. And so it started that way. But then as, as he collected more and more stuff, it was just, okay, this is more than a catalog of comet like things. Let's broaden it and so he did have star clusters um, but some of the 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 ones are really interesting um they, they do tend to as i said it's a top 100 objects out there um but i would um very much uh, encourage you to uh, head into the finest ngc list um because you'll find a lot of uh, really neat especially the star clusters 
uh, and the planetary nebula, because you'll get something like the blinking planetary nebula, NGC 6826 up in Cygnus. Um, I've seen it so often I can remember the name like a telephone number. Um, <laughs> and that one is, is really cool because um, when you look at it, it reveals a characteristic of your the way your eye behaves in light, what we call averted vision, where the light that your retina is more sensitive off to the side than it is directly in front. So if you stare right at this planetary nebula, it'll disappear on you. And then you shift your eye off a bit and whoop, pops back up again. That's uh, cool. And many of the, the fantastic Hubble shots are of these planetary nebulas. The Eskimo Nebula is another one where uh, that, that works. Um, the Blue Snowball, the Ghost of Jupiter. They, they, they've got so many great names. Um, and, and those are often to me, better than some of the messy objects. A lot of them are these uh, indistinct, diffuse galaxies out in, out in the middle of uh, uh, the Coma Virgo cluster, and uh, they're, 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 they can be pretty tough in the city, but planetary nebula, they can shine through as long as you're not looking at like the helix. That's not a city object, even though its numbers might indicate that. Just because, um, just because it's bigger and it has, so the light is spread out of spread out over more area, I guess. Eh? That's right. And yeah. there's actually in the handbook there's uh, a segment um, uh, to talk that talks about the visib a calculator that helps you figure out uh, the surface brightness, what we call. Um, a starlight, all its light is concentrated in one spot, but if you spread it out it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Mm. Um, and so uh, an object like uh, the uh, M33, the Pinwheel Triangulum Galaxy, it's often known as a challenge object amongst beginner observers because it's so diffuse. But if you crushed all its light together, it would be fifth magnitude. Oh, wow. Um, or five and a half or something like that. Uh, so. Um, it, th that whole thing of size, large but faint versus small but bright, that, that surface brightness plays a huge role in uh, observing uh, deep sky objects. And that's uh, something that is uh, um, explored in, the, in detail in the, uh, um, it, in the part where there are words <laughs> ahead of the table. We'll mm -hmm. often talk about uh, this kind of thing. Um, I'll... Uh, uh, I've already mentioned the uh, the best NGCs, the new general catalog number. Uh, and again, in there, uh, if you go down the remarks, every now and then you'll see double exclamation marks. Well, that's your, your cue to say that's probably what I should look at, first of all. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, one other aspect of uh, deep sky observing uh, is in the next section called dark nebulae. And a hundred years ago, um, they didn't know what dark nebulae were. They knew they existed. When you looked at the Milky Way, there's these dark lanes all through it. And at the time, uh, it was, well, maybe there just aren't any stars in that direction, so it's dark. Hmm. And you know, shortly after uh, that, um, in the, the 1910s, they realized, it's dust and gas that's not glowing, but it's there and it's enough to hide the stars in behind. And so um, some of the more famous ones uh, are called Barnard objects. So you'll see the B uh, list there. Oh, yeah. uh, some, of, some of them are, um, oh, I, I, I should uh, just step back for a second. Uh, do not attempt these from the city mm. uh, because you're looking for something essentially black <laughs> against a brighter gray sky. So you're not going to see it. Uh, but out, out in the country, um, you, what you're looking for is essentially an area where there is no stars. And in the Milky Way, where there's this dust and gas is hiding, blocking the light from the stars from behind. Um, and so some of these are going to be uh, the the most obvious ones um, and and there, there's uh, I've got a few favorites in there uh, uh, to be sure um, I, I love the one that uh, goes from um, uh, near the Messier 39 cluster in Cygnus down to the cocoon nebula there's a, a little dark 
lane going down and oh, that's in there cool. somewhere uh, but the the probably the one of the more famous ones that is on this list here is part of what's called the prancing horse nebula mm. And that's a huge, uh, perfect for binoculars and, and the naked eye. Um, down in Sagittarius, um, in, in summer, when you see the Milky Way coming down towards the southern horizon, uh, but especially you see it often in pictures and the horses, well, it's, it's prancing, but it's also, from our perspective, tilted up on its hind legs a lot. And mm -hmm. the hind quarters of the leg is the Barnard's Pipe Nebula. And oh. so, uh, again, if you, you put the telescope on it, here's this um, amazing thing where all of a sudden the stars just, where'd they all go? Um, and and uh, there's a couple of others in there right near the um, large Sagittarius star cloud, Messier 24. Uh, to me, it, uh, it reminds me of at, at low power uh, where um, you've got a, a star field and it's as if a painter took a brush of black ink and just went... And mm. you get these splatters of black around the edges of, of this thing. Oh, so cool. uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, one of the things to do for. But save it for the star party when you're out in, in real darkness. And again, follow the exclamation marks. Hit those first. Uh, there's uh, like just about everything in astronomy. Um, the the you, You've got the top 100 and then the next hundred thousand get just get fainter and fainter and fainter um so uh, start with the, with the real uh, bright ones and um that pretty much wraps it up oh i should yeah you had the dark uh, the challenge list there yes before before we get into the challenge objects i just wanted to um ask you a question from the comments from janine um wondering what the difference between globular clusters and galaxies were she read recently that globular clusters don't contain dark matter do you know anything about that stuff? Um, I can't speak to the dark matter content part, but um, really the 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 difference is um, amount. Uh, a globular star cluster would have um, tens of thousands to a million stars, sometimes a bit more, but a galaxy would have a billion stars, so a thousand times more stars than that. Um, and quite typically, uh, a galaxy, which has, like Milky Way, we're verging on a trillion stars, but all around it are these globulars that are orbiting our galaxy. So um, they, they would be, for sure, dense, packed, lots of stars, but nowhere near the, the scale of, uh, of it. In um, one of the analogies I've seen a lot, think of a globular cluster as an apartment building, whereas a galaxy is like a city. Mm. And it's, it, it's dense, but not as big mm -hmm. as uh, an entire galaxy. Now, that being said, some of the smaller galaxies where you just had less gas to begin with, would just clump together and the core of those galaxies would be dense as well. But if they're um, sort of essentially underpopulated, think of it again with the city type of thing, it's a town instead of, <laughs> uh, uh, and so the, the contents of that town um, would be um, the core of it uh, is a globular cluster. So some of the ones that, some of the globular clusters that we have discovered a hundred years ago, it's only more recently in the last 40, 30 years that we've realized that is the remnant of a small galaxy that got essentially cannibalized by our parent Milky Way. And all that's left of it is the heart of that galaxy, which we see as a globular cluster surrounded by a stream of stars that have kind of got lost in the eating of the uh, of the cannibalization. So th there are some uh, trans, in some ways, they're transition objects. Very cool, very cool. Thank you for your answer. And yes, we do have a couple more charts, just a heads up for timing. It is 4.30 um, or 2.30 or 1.30. It is an hour past when we started. <laughs> um, and so I we'll was, just- I was gonna make this uh, very short for the, the challenge objects. Um, one of the, the important thing here is um, that it, it's not for just 
humongous telescopes. We deliberately created this list. So even if you have uh, a four inch telescope, there'll be something here to challenge you. And that's, again, the idea is to just to kind of uh, open up your imagination. And sometimes it requires just the most finest, darkest night you can get. And this stuff will just pull out of the background. So um, even if you have uh, a four inch telescope, go down the list, look at the, the minimum aperture column there on the right and um, go after oh, cool. uh, one or two of them like there, there's j900 there's there's one of my favorite planetary uh, nebula the the trick is not can you see it it's can you see that it's a disc because it's a tiny planetary nebula oh. it just looks like a star so there's challenges for for telescopes of all sizes cool that's awesome wow thank you and so much with that, that segues into uh, the certificates. And yeah. So I'm going to mention a couple things about the certificates that we have. Um, that so the uh, I'm going to switch over to my own screen. Hold on, just for this is already my screen. Just a second. I'm going to share um, my Chrome screen to talk about the um, observing programs. So the RSC is one of the main RSC's main um, mandates is to get people out and looking at the stars. And we have several observing programs to do that. They're listed on this website and I'll send the link around. Uh, most of these come with a pin. These are the pins that you can get for finishing your observing programs. Um, and it's really cool. It allows you to sort of look at things a little bit more scientifically. If you're not so inclined to write things down, you can um, use logbook pages to sketch what you're seeing and take notes on, on the conditions that you're, uh, that you're observing in. Uh, there's lots of different types. There's MGC ones. There's a couple lunar ones. We have the uh, Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program, as well as an Explore the Moon certificate. Um, we, these are the, uh, the two easiest ones to start with, the Explore the Universe and Explore the Moon. The, the Explore the Universe is the only program that's open to non-RASC members. Of course, all of you here are RASC members, so you can do any of these. Um, with Explore the Moon, you can do it either with binoculars or a telescope bearing in mind that you need to do it with a telescope to be able to get the pin. Um, and the Explore the Universe you can do just with binoculars. Uh, and now I have a, an announcement to make actually about our next project because we are wrapping this one up, which means I have oodles of time on my hands. <laughs> um, and so we're starting a new project, um, which is we are going to be doing Explore the Universe online. And we're starting that at the end of June. We're starting at June 25th, it's gonna run uh, at 3.30 on Thursdays, don't worry, uh, it's going to be recorded and on YouTube, and so you'll be able to watch it afterwards if you're busy at work. Um, sorry, did I say Tuesdays? I meant Thursdays, if I said Tuesdays. Uh, so uh, 3.30 on Thursdays, every other Thursday, starting on June 25th and going until October. If you follow along with us the whole time, we will show you how to find all the objects that you need uh, in that time window to get your certification and get your PIN. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to working through the program. I actually have, well, I mean, I've observed twice before. Um, and so I'm gonna be working with people who have observed far more than I have, including our observing committee uh, and our co-host, who's going to be John Reed from Halifax. Um, and we're gonna walk through how to find all the objects. Uh, and my boss actually, Phil, is gonna be joining as well doing this program, as is our marketing coordinator, Eric. We're all really excited to be working through the program with you guys. Uh, there will be details at this website. This is where I've got what we have so far in terms of the timing um, and what you need. All you need is binoculars uh, and a notebook and how to register and what the sessions are going to be about. So we have that all up here. We also have a couple extra resources uh, if you're interested in joining us and following along and getting some uh, tips and tricks to help with stuff. So I'm going to post that link in the chat right now. There you go. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Um, and I hope, I look forward to having you guys join us. I think it's gonna be a really great program. Um, and we're gonna take a, a dive into using, actually using the Observer's Handbook together to find the things that we need to uh, with the Explore the Universe program. So we're gonna use a combination of things. Handbook is one of them, Solarium is another. Um, and I'm, part of the reason that we even started with this program or even thought of this program was from doing this series with you, Alistair and James and everyone who's been helping us out. I have a brand new and amazing understanding of the handbook. I feel so much more confident using it now. And I hope that the folks who've joined us uh, feel the same as well. People, I'm, I'm so glad the folks who have joined us are excited about it and have enjoyed the series. Um, and it's all on uh, our YouTube account. You can't 
find it from the YouTube account, but if you're logged in, you can find it from this page, which will have uh, all the links. This is the whole playlist of all the videos that we have seen so far. Uh, if anyone wants to go back and rewatch, you have to be logged in to see that page, but it's all there um, and you can rewatch the whole series if you ever need it. I think that's it. And we don't actually have that many questions. I will mention that if you do have questions about anything to do with the Observer's Handbook, please send them my way and I will um, uh, get James to maybe film a little video following up on some questions. Um, and a massive thank you as well to, oh, there's one question up. Oh, it's just a thank you. Thanks, Ron. Um, and massive thank you as well to Alistair for being here today. It was great to have you on, on for our very final session. Um, and thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. Pleasure. On thank you. Thanks, everybody. We will see you not next time because this is the last of the series, but we will see you in the Explore the Universe series and we can't wait. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a Bye. wonderful afternoon and we'll see you later. Take care. Clear skies. Clear skies.